good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, thanks very much for um, for attending this this event tonight. Uh, my name is Mark Ruskell, Green Party MSP for uh, Mid Scotland and Fife. Um, delighted to see um, so many folk here tonight, um, and perhaps it's with a, a sense of irony because I'm sure very few of us have been on a train, unfortunately, in in the last uh, eight months or so. You know the advice at the moment is to not go on public transport because of the COVID crisis. Um, but I think all of us are thinking now about the recovery, about the green recovery. And I think we all see the railways as a hugely important part of that. But there's also recognition that we're going to need to relaunch our public transport um, as we come out of the COVID crisis. And I think we can relaunch it stronger uh, and, and better and more responsive for communities. Um, and in terms of what that new normal is, is going to look like, I mean, I, I hope personally that there's going to be perhaps a little bit less traffic on the roads. We're probably going to be reliant a little bit more on home working, which is not a bad thing. But it does leave a space now for public transport, in particular rail, to provide that support in our lives, whether we're trying to get to work, whether we're getting access to educational opportunities or leisure uh, or, or whatever. So it's a great time, I think, to be reimagining our rail network reimagining what it can do post-COVID. And I, certainly in my last five years uh, as an MSP covering Mid-Scotland and Fife, I think many of you are here from Mid-Scotland and Fife tonight, but I know we've got folks from Edinburgh and Highlands as well. And um, so this is the Clatmanan shire, um, Perthshire, um, Stirling and, and Fife areas. Um, across, the, across my region, there's been a huge amount of interest in reconnecting forgotten communities uh, to the rail network. And I think over the years, uh, we've all seen the, uh, the tremendous success of the reopening of lines such as Stirling to Alloa, the, the reinstatement of passenger services, and then in recent years, the Borders Rail Route. And just the kind of benefits that that has brought to communities, um, brought to the economy and the areas that those rail routes serve. And I think there's a real appetite now to see more of these forgotten communities reconnected back to the rail network again. So I, I've been working with my team um, with a number of uh, community campaigns that have been getting louder and louder across the region in the last five years. We're delighted to work with the Levermouth Rail campaign. I can see Eugene and a number of others from that campaign here tonight uh, who, who have won and they've been successful in getting the funding now to reopen uh, that rail route down to Levermouth. Seven miles, I think it is. Um, with a station at the end, a forgotten community, and hopefully that, that rail route will be open by 2023. Um, but we've also been working uh, with communities in Clatman and Alloa and Kincardine as well. We hosted a number of events, which I think many, some of you here tonight would have attended about a year ago, uh, where we're looking at the potential to extend that Alloa rail route, potentially all the way to Dunfermline, but certainly then reconnecting communities like Clatman and and Kincardine along the way. And I've been very pleased to work in Fife as well uh, with communities in Newbra who are looking to see their station reinstated. And also I think an ambitious campaign that's been running for many years now, uh, St Andrews Starlink campaign, to build a new rail link from Lucas to St Andrews along a different route, uh, but a new rail link to reconnect that, that town again into the rail network and all the historic uh, you know, the, the historic visitors who come to the to the town, uh, the students, um, it, there's a fantastic economic opportunities there as well for people who live in the local area. Um, so we pulled all these campaigns together and we've been forming a sort of Fife Rail Forum uh, over the last few years. And one of the things that Rail Forum told us that we needed was a, a fund, if you like, to help communities build up the business case for rail reopenings. And we're very pleased to get some success through the Scottish budget. The Green Party negotiated uh, with the SNP a budget deal a few years ago now, which sets up a £2 million fund to enable communities to do that feasibility work. I know that both Newborough and St Andrews rail campaigns were successful in getting some of that funding. And then last year, we were also successful through the budget deal in getting some specific money for some more feasibility work, which has been spent in relation to the Alloa uh, Kincardine route. So things are starting to move. 
But I think at the back of our minds, you know, we're also thinking it's all very well connecting all these communities uh, and adding more and more stations and more local services. But what about the bigger picture of Scotland's rail uh, infrastructure? Um, you know, should we not be decarbonizing our railways, putting in more electric lines? Um, what about, for example, the Highland uh, main line, which is still single track after many, many years? What about the journey times between Perth and Edinburgh, which are now longer than they were, I think, over 100 years ago? And I think there are big questions here about how you expand the rail network, expand the number of communities that are connected to that rail network, while at the same time improving services, making sure we've got greener, faster trains. So we commissioned uh, the two Davids who are here tonight to present David Spaven and David Prescott, um, long-term experienced uh, rail consultants, folk have been spending much of their careers working within the rail industry. We commissioned them and Deltix Consulting to, to give us a vision document, if you like, about what an expanded rail network across Scotland should look like. What are the key components we need to put in place, not just stations, but key components that can help expand the capacity and help to reduce congestion on the network. And they've come up with I think, a really ambitious, really exciting um, and much discussed actually vision uh, through the Rail for All report, which they're going to uh, present in a, in a few minutes time. And uh, we can have tonight, I think, a good opportunity for discussions and questions uh, to the two Davids about the Rail for All report. But then um, later on, we're going to be able to break into, using this uh, great hopping system, um, some uh, breakout rooms. And uh, my colleague Mags Hall will give you an induction into that after we've heard from the two Davids. But basically, you'll be able to move from one session to the next, uh, whatever topic interests you. Um, the two Davids will be moving around as well to answer the technical questions and get into discussion. And we've got a couple of workshops you'll see there uh at the, the main um uh, page for the for this session we've got a workshop on don fern and Alla and st andrew's leaven uh we've also got a persia workshop looking at some issues around newborough and udenard and uh, and the perth station upgrades um and we've got a highland mainline discussion as well facilitated by my colleague ariane burgess and we've got a, an interesting discussion i think around some issues about mid fife as well and the bridges and also the fourth tunnel which is um, a, a particular project which has come out of the report which has been generating a lot of interest about how we build capacity across the fourth. Uh, and once we have those workshops we'll have some brief feedback and we should be finished by about 8.30 if we're running to schedule although this timetable we might go a little bit over that. Um, but yeah so that's that from me just now in terms of introductory comments. I think what I'm going to do now is um, hopefully pass over to David. Uh, I don't know which David would like to go first. I mean, David, David Spaven um i think but um we'll, we'll get a, a presentation on the rail for all report last about 15 minutes and after that i'll bring mags in and we'll just let you know then how you can engage in discussion and asking questions to the two davids before we go into the workshops so i think uh that's it lots of interesting comments that we can come back to on the chat box please feel free to use that um but i'm going to hand over to the to the presentation thank you um as you'll see from the screen, David Prescott and I are pretty long in the tooth. Um, David uh, joined the rail industry full time in 1974. And as he mentioned to me uh, not so long ago, that was just 11 years after Dr. Beeching's infamous report. I actually joined the railway in 1973 in my student holidays up in, uh, in Inverness. So we've both been around the industry for a long time. And I hope that um, we'll be able to take you through the, the gist of what we've done in the Rail for All report. If you could now go to the next slide. And then... This is not very clever. Um, we're, what we're going to talk about tonight is the brief. Uh, then we'll go through our approach. Next. Then an overview of the current rail network. Uh, talk about creating the right delivery framework for all these uh, ho hopefully positive proposals. Uh, we'll then go through the highlights of our proposals. We've had to, to summarise this uh, to quite an extent because our report is actually over 100 pages long. And we'll be looking at intercity, regional and freight. Um, if we can now move on to the next slide, please. Yeah. 
This was basically our brief to produce an inspiring, credible and costed vision for the expansion and upgrade of the rail network in Scotland over the next 10 years, although in fact we took that into a rather longer time frame. Uh, we felt that would give a greater degree of continuity. Um, this is in response to the climate emergency and, and obviously without saying it, the obvious, the, uh, a key objective is, uh, is zero carbon. On a more prosaic level, uh, John Finney, who commissioned us in January of last year, wanted us to look at the Strategic Transport Projects Review 2, which is now going on, uh, so that the ideas we came up with could be fed into that key process. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is catalyse a modal shift from road to rail. OK, could we have the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Uh, our approach, next bullet please, uh, this is what we looked at, the patronage trends, the policy context and the environmental impact of transport operations. Next bullet, uh, a point that's been raised by some people is what about whole life carbon impacts, uh, particularly in the context of the, the fourth tunnel, which will generate quite a lot of carbon in terms of its construction. But that was well beyond the remit we had. It would have required a, a really major study to tackle that. So we looked at the carbon impacts in terms of, of operations, but not construction. But rather interestingly, in terms of looking at carbon impacts across the whole transport spectrum, uh, I noticed the Scottish Parliament Information Service today published a report about the Infrastructure Investment Plan very much highlighted the disproportionate carbon impact of the duelling of the A9 and the A96. So and that's, I think, the essence of what we are saying, that rail is much more carbon effective than road. So we looked at the current network and the gaps, both rural, freight, intercity, and indeed in the conurbations as well, although we, we won't really be touching on that tonight. And the next one. And finally, we produced a costed prioritised programme. And I think very important to emphasise, this is based on existing technologies, not on things that are unproven. And it includes lots of things that can be done very quickly to cut carbon. Uh, that's one of our key messages. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, our overview of the current network in Scotland. Um, one of the key points in relation to zero carbon is how much of the network is already electrified. At one level, the, the picture is not that encouraging. It's only 32% of the overall route network is electrified, and Dunblane is the current northern limit of electrification. Next bullet. However, if you actually look at the number of passenger journeys uh, on electric trains, the figure is 75%, 76%, uh, which is a lot more encouraging. And next bullet. 45% of freight trains are electrically hauled. And this is overwhelmingly on the West Coast main line, down to Carlisle, uh, to the Midlands of England, to European markets and deep sea markets. So there's some good stuff happening. There's a lot, there's a lot to build on there. Thank you. Next slide. What about the current network? Um, our, our overview of that, and I'll just give you a sample of that just now. Capacity bottlenecks, particularly west of Edinburgh, and really from Waverley, through Haymarket and going westwards towards Glasgow and towards the Forth Bridge. There are capacity difficulties there. OK, rather different now, um, but pre-pandemic, um, a number of difficulties uh, with accommodating any more trains there. Ladybank Perth is worth mentioning because that is now the route of uh, trains to Perth since the original route through Kinross closed back in 1970. 15 miles of single track, not a single crossing loop. There isn't any spare capacity at all. Uh, one of the cause celebre and one that uh, David and I have been going on about for many a long year is that two thirds of the, the Highland Main Line from Perth to Inverness is still single track, very much uh, a, a Victorian railway. Next one. Uh, there are speed restrictions on parts of the network. Uh, and those of you who travel on the train from, from Edinburgh to Kirkcaldy will know about all the restrictions north of the Forth Bridge, um, going through Aberdour, uh, the tunnel at Kinghorn, uh, Burnt Island, where the, the train wheels always screech as you go around the bend there. And there are also speed restrictions on the Tay Bridge. Next one. Uh, the missing lines, which Mark's already uh, referred to. Um, some key gaps in, in Fife, and it's rather interesting actually to reflect back to the Beeching report 
Um, most of the damage to branch lines in Fife was done after beaching. Beaching didn't propose the closure of Leavenmouth, he didn't propose the closure of St Andrews, and he didn't propose the closure of Dunfermline to Alloa. It was a subsequent Labour government that decided to do that. Next. There are gaps on the existing passenger routes as opposed to routes that only carry freight or are being abandoned. And Newbera, as Mark has already mentioned, is one of the, the key locations. It's been studied a number of times and both David and I have been involved in studies of the case for Newbera. Next one, please. Um, freight is often forgotten about um, and yet it can be very significant in terms of its contribution towards zero carbon. And uh, the picture you see here is of Cameron Bridge Distillery, which is now the largest grain distillery in Europe, right beside the, the mothballed leaving mouth line. And next bullet, please. And those of you who live near Alawa will know about the Cambus Black Grange bonded warehouse complex. It's actually the largest one in the whole of Europe. And I think what's rather interesting to reflect in all this if these two locations were in a continental European country, you can be absolutely certain that we'd already long have been connected to the rail network, but not here. Okay, the next slide, and that's the, the final one for me setting the scene. Um, we wanted to look at the structures and the framework because very often the situation in Scotland has been that the, the framework is not conducive to making good decisions and getting things implemented quickly. So one of the four key things in, in our recommended framework is to streamline the decision making processes and rebalance them in favour of rail and indeed other low carbon modes. And the next one, we feel that a lot of duplication and elements of disintegration would be eliminated by creating one publicly owned operator running and maintaining both the infrastructure and the train services, and as indeed it used to be in the days of, of British Rail. Uh, we think there should be a strategic decision to deliver a modern zero carbon rail network and a line behind this. In other words, to put in place a programme rather than getting bogged down in lots of uh, piecemeal investment appraisals uh, and funding decisions. And the next one. And to do that, we think there should be a small focused task force to take us forward to this strong commitment to the improvement of the rail network. So these are structural things. The, the next point and the last one I'd like to make, this is to emphasize the point that not only is there a fundamental environmental objective to all this, there's a social objective as well. And what we've suggested in our report, and it's, it's argued in some detail, is that all towns over 5,000 population in Scotland should have rail access. That does mean a lot of new places coming on the network and probably plenty of you will say, well, some of those are quite difficult and you'd be right in saying that. But what we feel is if it's not feasible for various reasons to get every last town over 5,000 onto the network, what we should develop is what we call a ScotRail integrated coach network. So in terms of train and bus timings, ticketing, etc that you can get on a coach, let us say, somewhere like Crail, and that will take you to the station at Leavenmouth where the services will be integrated. Now, easier said than done in a deregulated transport environment, but this is a good aspiration to have, and people who have been to Switzerland will know how it works there. Wouldn't it be great if Scotland could be like Switzerland, perhaps in many ways? So that's me. I'm now going to pass over to David, who's going to take you through the nitty gritty of our specific proposals. Thanks, David. Uh, is that okay? Yep. Um, right. Next, next point, please, Rowan. Um, the first thing is, and this is seems to be what government are already proposing, but actually, what we're saying is we need to electrify the mainline network by 2030, not the 2035 that uh, is currently on horizon. And uh, next, please, that uh, that is. Dunblane to Perth, Dundee, Aberdeen and Inverness, that's the one element. And the other side of it, next please, is Edinburgh to Kirkcaldy, Perth and Dundee. That does the whole network. The reason for that is if we're not careful, um, all that will happen is we'll buy much more expensive bimode trains to fill the gaps. That'll just let the whole time string out as bits of uh, difficult bits aren't done. And the current HSTs have 
got a relatively limited life, it really doesn't make sense to buy temporary units if we can avoid it. The, the second big proposal was the fourth tunnel, um, which is, if you like, the eye-catching proposal. It has had surprisingly good press for something like this. A done site better press than Boris's tunnel has had. Um, <laughs> and just as an aside, there are as many people living in the catchment north of the fourth as there are living in the whole of Northern Ireland. So it isn't such a silly idea. Um, we'll have a bit more about that in a minute. There's great separation at Green Hill. It's a flyover. It was taken out of the Edinburgh Glasgow programme. It's quite important in the context of trying to free up the capacity into Glasgow on a constrained stretch. Um, it makes quite a significant difference. And we think, uh, next one, uh, we need to add about 30 miles of double track to the Highland Main Line. We have deliberately tried to be pragmatic. Um, everybody would like double track everywhere. It makes life easier. But trains are timetabled. There are constraints on the network. And if you do it properly and considered, then those 30 miles in the right place will effectively give you a double track railway for, for the purposes you need. Um, and that's, that's trying to be realistic, but it also means you'll get there rather quicker. Next, please. The fourth tunnel, you can sort of just see it, but basically it's come out of Edinburgh at the east end, go round towards Abbey Hill, uh, the old loop line, which isn't in use at the moment, disappear underground, uh, station at Leith, um, right in the middle of Leith, um, you c and then straight across the fourth to the sort of point where Seafield Colliery used to be very roughly to join up with the, the existing line north. Um, it cuts about 25 minutes off the long distance journey time and the local journey time. It puts Leith in direct connection with the wider world. Um, and if you think about it, you could probably do Leith to Haymarket in something like 10 minutes, uh, which is quite transformational for Leith. Um, an underground station, but something to be worked through. Um, it releases capacity in the west of Edinburgh, and that's one of the reasons why going across the fourth bridge is effectively, we're virtually at capacity through Haymarket Station already. Um, a lit the Almond Cord part of the Edinburgh Glasgow proposal, which linked uh, the, across the north side of the airport, helps to balance up the loads on the two different lines through Haymarket, but it is really a sticking plaster to, to get over the last bit. It provides a diversionary route for the old bridge. The old bridge is in excellent condition. It'll last for a very long time, but it does need a lot of TLC. And a, an estimated cost, and this wasn't me, it was taken from professionals, was of the order of four to six billion. Now that's also in line with the kind of tunnel costs under the Irish Sea, and it's similar to the kinds of costs that are coming out for the A9 duelling, which was three billion pounds in 2010. Next, please. Um, sorry, we've been through those, so. Um, right, we've covered that. So the regional highlights, we cut the fourth tunnel, will cut the journey time to East Fife, uh, and northeast Fife by 25 minutes. It transforms the access to Edinburgh in the well well defined one hour commuter time. Next, please. The it provides extra fourth uh, capacity across the fourth bridge to serve Dunfermline and potentially Alloa. Um, next, please. So that gives us links into the new routes into Long uh, Leavenmouth, into the Alloa route. Because Alloa is quite difficult to get through and potentially also with the extra capacity to get a decent service to St. Andrews. But equally, there's the importance of trying to make sure we get the links through to the airport. Um, I think it's important to note in the past, uh, and this is true of a lot of transport planning, uh, reopenings are not very well um, forecast. Transport planning is very good at forecasting incremental change. It's extremely difficult to forecast fundamental change. Uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. And, and it's not just railways. The M25 around London is as good an example as any. Um, 
and the last bit is uh, the the coach network. Um, please, last slide. So we've got to fill in the gaps to the places where we don't think we can realistically get railways in the sort of time scale. So around the East Nook of Fife, which I think will become quite strong with um, with the needs for with the opportunity if the tunnel is built um, in the Keating through to Kinross and Perth as filling the link, uh, not exactly replacing the, the um, Strathmore line, but uh, Perth to Blairgowrie and Cooper Angus to link in on that side, uh, and Stirling Dunblane Creef um, as one of the other over 5,000 towns that's, that's missing a, a proper link. Uh, and these are long distance links. Next slide, please. Um, on the freight side, I think the first thing is to say that this is one of the areas where we can generate the biggest reduction in carbon dioxide emissions from transport because freight trains, even diesel haul freight trains, emit so much less carbon for every tonne carried. So moving traffic from road to rail, even old diesel trains, diesel locomotives, makes a massive difference it can be done now you can just move on and start to make a big difference electrification has a huge benefit to go with it which is why you need the intercity routes fully electrified but that's the, that's the key bit whiskey is one of the key sectors it's such a big scottish uh, export and got a boost today with the removal of the tariffs um, the intermodal railhead pictures in the corner cameron bridge huge uh, production facility and bottling facility and a private siding alongside the, the facility at Blackgrange Camus would really make a difference to bringing whiskey down the A9, um, move it off the A9, move it out of Bridge of Allen uh, and, and move it forward. That's, that's a real opportunity. Improved loading gauges. This is very, sounds very technical, but basically a lot of our railway can't carry modern nine foot six high containers that are used for deep sea travel without knocking the corners off them or knocking the corners off the bridges they we need to move the loading gauge and there are two particular routes cameron bridge to dunfermline uh, aloha uh, and then into the main link from sterling which is fine and then you go south to england or to the ports or to grangemouth or wherever uh, next one please uh, and the other one is to enhance the Highland Main Line to both handle bigger containers, also in this context wider containers because uh, insulated containers are a little bit wider to, to hold the insulation. Uh, and there is a ready market of chilled products to, to go up the A9 if we could just get them through the tunnels and bridges. And the loops lengthened in the right places very quickly we could move from 20 to 28 containers on the train. So the price of those marginal eight containers is literally um, eight platforms, four, four wagon pairs. So the same driver, the same locomotive, almost the same fuel, the same track access. It's a huge benefit and it reduces the marginal cost and makes rail much more competitive. Um, final slide, please. And this was probably difficult for you to all read, but we did put some notional costs to them. They are well considered costs from a range of public sources. Um, and it's also designed to set out the kind of short, medium and long term kinds of expenditure. So uh, stations and new routes, stations you could do really soon, new routes and route upgrades you start now um, and, and progress forward. Electrification, we start now and complete in the middle period something like the tunnel starts in the middle period and it's going to take a long time to prepare for it and we go forward into the later period which is sort of 2034 to 2040 um, so we sort of set out seven year time periods of a short term a middle term and a long term um, it gives you an idea of the nature of expenditure and to try and make sure it's balanced and also that the industry itself can can gear up um i suspect this in reality would start to change somewhat 
but we're also looking for additional freight specific expenditure because we think there are lots of freight opportunities and that i think has finished our presentation um i hope it was Great. helpful and interesting thanks very much um to the both of you that was that was fascinating and there's a huge amount of information in there as well um, for us to delve into. I mean, personally, it's really great seeing some thinking here about our transport needs going right out to 2040. I mean, I think this is a long-term timescales and visions that we that we need to have right now. And sometimes in politics, we're very much locked into the short term and what's available from, from year to year. So there's lots to think about in there. I'm aware that we've got, you know, uh, people here tonight, some people who have a lot of detailed knowledge about rail, um, others who may be just curious and are just interested to find out about what may or may not be happening in their area. So as I said earlier on, we'll have some quick workshops where you can delve into particular areas of interest. But if there are questions right now um, for our two speakers, um, there are two ways that we can you can address those in, in Hopin. Um, I notice there's a huge amount of information coming up in chat and all sorts of interesting stuff in the in the chat box. But if I could ask you, if you want to um, to ask a question, if you could put an R in the chat box and uh, we can bring you in uh, into the session. Uh, however, if you don't want to ask it, you just want to write it down, then if you could put your questions in the chat box just now in written form or your request to speak using the R, putting an R in, and uh, and we can bring you in and we start a little bit late um we can go on a little bit later though um so uh, i'm not going to constrain this we've maybe got to 10 15 minutes so um we're gonna we're gonna kick off and we've got a first r in the chat box and that's from bryce goodall um oh hi there guys hi there um i just wanted to say fantastic presentation by the way and i just wanted just to see about the possible accessibility and about because of autism and the thing is this vote is about is connect social mobility and basically um one of our things as well is that by having electrification means that there's going to be a lot of less noise inside the carriage and meaning that basically that there's going to be a sensory overload for people with neuro neurodiverse issues and um, so the thing is this was i'm just thinking about the benefits that will happen with people who are who are who are disabled and who are um, who want to have more greater social mobility, and they just wanted to say I welcome the plans of, of the Green Party and our party, shall I say, for uh, for a fantastic electrification and um, expanding the line. So go for it, absolutely. We need to. We need a, We need rail for every single person, including the disabled and including the including the neurodiverse. Thank you very much. That's great, Bryce. I'm going to take one more question and then uh, put it back to to the two Davids. Um, so this is from Ken. I don't know if you want to articulate, Ken, but you said in the chat box here that could COP26 not be used as a lever for Diageo. Um, so I don't know who would like to take that. So the Bryce's first question there about um, accessibility and that, and that experience, particularly for people who are, who are neurodiverse and disabled. I, I mean, I suppose that what it struck me about this is that really there are so many benefits from electrification. It is a no brainer. And the idea of, you know, less noise. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely one of the immediate impacts, but there are much wider societal and, and environmental benefits operational benefits for the railway the trains you know can get from uh, edinburgh to inverness more quickly can come back more quickly you need fewer train sets um all kinds of benefits so really it's that wide-ranging benefit which underpinned our suggestion the scottish government should go for electrification of the main lines by 2030 rather than 2035 so we can get the benefits in all these ways as early as possible yeah um, David, do you want to answer the, the point about Diageo and how we get Diageo to start using the rail network more effectively? Is COP26, I believe? Uh, in the end, uh, Diageo has no way of saying this politely. In the end, Diageo will do what is commercially important to them. They, they run their business in a particular fashion. Um, and it's 
not one that sees a, a strong move towards this not necessarily putting money in but putting in commitment i think this is the real frustration they're not being seen to put the commitment in to providing uh, supporting the facility and enabling those who would invest to be confident that they can go forward i think that's the key thing they have to be confident an investor has to be confident that his business is particularly if it's a one company business it is going to be viable so i think there is some real pressure the whiskey industry does make big plays on being green but they also spend an awful lot of money driving lorries up and down the a9 a vast number of lorries mm -hmm. and they are a significant part of the the cost of that road um, in terms of the yeah. damage they do to to the road surface and that's one of the things that people always ignore lorries do hundreds of thousands of times more damage than cars uh, and where the surface mm. we can maybe come back to some of those points david as well like in the um in yeah. the workshop particularly in the leaving workshop um okay a point here by um malcolm um i don't know if any of our contributors want to want to sort of come back on this but it's particularly in relation to ensuring that there's good pedestrian infrastructure and pointing out that some of the infrastructure in, in Alloa bridges are not not well maintained. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm happy to come back on that because with another hat on, mm. I'm a, a campaigner with uh, with Living Streets in Edinburgh. And um, I think that there's just one point that I would make. Yes, walking, although it's supposedly the top of the list of modal transport priorities with the Scottish Government. The reality on the ground is just the opposite of that. Walking's at the very bottom. Uh, I think there's increasing recognition of that. I think it's very important when looking at ways of improving walking and cycling access to stations, both those that are already open and, and future stations, is that actually walking and cycling needs are generally very different. It's not really that clever to lump them all together under the banner of active travel. Um, walking's all about pavements and road crossings. Uh, and that's something that's been lost sight of. And I remember when Haymarket Station was being upgraded, there was all sorts of consultation about, we must get the interchange right with the tram, we must get the interchange with the buses right, we must get parking right, we, we, uh, we must get it right for cycling. Walking wasn't even mentioned. So we've got to make sure we get that right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, right. I'm going to bring in Chaz Booth, uh, who's a council colleague in, in Edinburgh. Chaz. Uh, just Chaz and anyone else, if you're called to come in and speak, you need to click the button at the top that says share your audio and video. If you click that, then I can add you to the screen. There we go. Okay. okay now, can you? Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Very, uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I, I'm I'm one of the green councillors in Leith, and I'm going to ask a very parochial question about Leith, and then section of your report that talks about the, which I read with a lot of interest. You put lots of examples. I completely understand why you're you're arguing for it. You've put lots of examples about other similar tunnels. I'm particularly interested in the uh, proposal for a, an underground station in Leith. I'm interested if there are other examples around the world that have something similar. Um, and one of the comments that I've heard back from some of my constituents is, oh, if you're going to be tunneling from Abbey Hill, you're going to be going underneath my house. What's that? What are the impacts going to be? So I know we've got a whole workshop on, on, on the... I just wonder if you could about that that section of your report, please, which I found fascinating. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll respond to that one. Um, I think if we take the station first, um, we've had substantial experience in um, the UK recently and with Crossrail in London in building stations. You, they've been built very satisfactorily. Some of them are built in boxes. Some of them are built completely underground. Um, they, this has been going on for a long time. So I, I think even in the UK, we've got reasonable experience of building stations underground. Obviously it has to be a completely electrified railway. Um, the, the tunneling underneath, 
once you get down to a certain depth, it, again, Crossrail is a good example. It, it really shouldn't have a significant impact. There are obviously issues that are going to arise in the tunnel mouths. And that's one of the reasons why I chose Abbey Hill, uh, because you do start off going down in the right direction. Um, just as an aside, it, tunneling always looks easy but the, the germ of this idea came from looking at tunnels when the replacement fourth crossing was being considered and the trouble with going down is quite often with the, the nature of the fourth is that you go down from the land and you have to go down from so far back to get underneath the water because the, the cliffs effectively on either side so your tunnel becomes incredibly long in relation to the, the crossing you're making I think that that will be a bit of a challenge at, at least but on the other hand, electric trains can go along some pretty steep curves and pretty um, sharp gradients. So I think we, we will be able to get underneath. At least there's enough to think about. Um, and the, the other point is that there has been a lot of tunneling under the fort, including out in both sides. I mean, Seafield Colliery used to work under the fort. So the geological conditions will be pretty well mapped and it's a long way it's, it, to, to go there's a lot of work to go on a project like that and I think the people of Leith if they're interested in it can grasp this as an opportunity my, my own vision and I did work in that um, Scottish government building just down on the on the waterfront at Leith at one time uh, so I know it moderately well uh, my, my own thought was possibly a station that was went from the foot of the walk underneath towards the waterfront and had access at either end. So you almost got two stations out of it. Um, but that was just, that was just my initial thought. Um, it's, it's not a done deal. You tell me whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> There'll be lots of appetite. Okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, good. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Chaz. And yeah, we'll, we'll get to a bit more detail with that in the workshop later on. I'm just going to run through just a couple of other questions because there's lots of really interesting points uh, on the chat, but I'm sensing that you probably want to get into the workshops quite soon and expand some of these. Um, Sean Mill was asking um, in particular about the practicalities of bringing back a Kinross station. Now, I know this is something that um, some of our colleagues and other parties in the Scottish Parliament are, are promoting in terms of reopening uh, a link effectively under the what is currently the M90 motorway up to Perth, but what what are your what are your thoughts on that? Um, Perhaps I could come in on that. Um, one hmm. of the reasons being that about six or seven years ago, I walked a fair section of the old railway um, from Kinross up towards Bridge of Earn, um, because of that feeling that we needed to reinstate a direct route, and. Um, Certainly, there are difficulties in the Kinross area. Um, the railway, not the railway Solom, not having been preserved, as happens right as happened right across Britain, not taking a strategic perspective to these corridors. So, various breaches. The worst being in Glenfarg itself, where several miles of the railway have completely disappeared because the railway was closed in order for the M90 to be built more cheaply. Um, so there's a, a difficulty there and the conclusion I came to with the colleague I walked it with was really you'd have to build about four miles of tunnel to avoid Glenfarg and then head towards Bridge of Earn. And uh, when I got discussing this with, with David Prescott, um, I pretty quickly became convinced that, you know, a bit more tunnelling, that's nine miles of tunnel for the fourth tunnel, really gives you so many more benefits than doing something going up through Kinross and Glenfarg because it benefits uh, Kirkcaldy, it ben benefits North East Fife, Dundee, Aberdeen, Perth, Inverness, very widely spread benefits. I mean, maybe there will be an argument for creating some kind of branch line from the Cowden Beath area up to just Kinross, the south end of Kinross as a park and ride. Who knows? That, that might be a possibility, uh, but it's not one we were able to look at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and I think uh, Claire Miller uh, asking me as well about the links then to uh, to this rail, these rail projects and rail for all report. So the, the idea of a green new deal and an investment in new green job creation. 
Um, I, I mean, I, I certainly see that as, as absolutely critical. And if I could pick sort of one of the projects in here, um, the reopening of a rail line to Long Gannett, I mean, this is, um, you know, absolutely, um, you know, in, integrated into the redevelopment of the whole Long Gannett area and, and Kincardine after the closure of Long Gannett coal fire power station and the loss of jobs as a result of that. So, you know, bringing the rail to Long Gannett, Kincardine and Clackmannan would, would really help to, you know, build the case then for industry to come back in to the area, come back into the site at Long Gannett. And in particular, you know, part of the business case around that at the moment is um, hopefully the, the the move of Talgo, the electric train manufacturer, and actually Hitachi as well onto the site, which could create new jobs in a low carbon industry. So, you know, that would be a fantastic legacy for the local community and the railway would very much be part of that. So I, I, I think there are links there and I think it's up for us to look on the ground at wh where the, you know, the practical job creation in new low carbon industries of the future uh, can be developed and how rail can really, you know, un unlock those opportunities. That's very exciting.